Well, hello, everybody. My name is Julia Nurbin, and I'm here tonight with uh, Gina Pelfier from Honor the Earth. Hello, Gina. Good to see you on. Um, and we are going to spend um, a little over an hour today talking with you about um, a very exciting event that's coming up on February 15th. And we're going to be talking about building movements and advocacy. How do we create the movements for change that we need in order for us to move forward in this world in a way that's powerful? Um, so we're gonna begin, Terry, I'm gonna ask if you will please read our land acknowledgement and, uh, and then we'll get started. Wonderful, thank you. So hello everyone, as we continue to gather I invite you to either close your eyes or lower your gaze to settle into this acknowledgement. Take a few breaths in as we acknowledge the land that we are on. Wherever you may be, let us acknowledge that we are all on indigenous land. Minnesota is located on the traditional and contemporary homelands of the Anishinaabe and Dakota peoples, the original stewards of this territory. We are committed to uplifting the name of these lands and the community members from these nations who reside alongside of us. We acknowledge the trauma that is deeply embedded in the foundation of this country the land we reside on came under control of the United States through genocide, slavery, and ongoing occupation. We recognize the deep historical, spiritual, and personal trauma that has impacted indigenous communities, communities of color, and immigrant communities. By offering this acknowledgement of trauma, we affirm the right of people to bring their whole selves and stories into this space. And we affirm our intention to promote healing, respect, and love. Thank you for your attention to this land acknowledgement. Thank you, Terry. It always calms me at, when I put my feet on the ground and I'm thinking about trying to present something that is useful and um, powerful to all of you um, to be reminded of where we come from and uh, and how it is that history can be um, both past, present, and future. And so here we are. Um, so I want to begin uh, by just giving you an overview of what we're going to do here tonight. Um, I'm thinking that we'll begin um, I'll ask some questions about what makes you feel powerful at moments of social ch change. Uh, we'll think a little bit about um, what are some of the ingredients of what makes a powerful movement. Um, I'm gonna talk about a couple of historical movement stories and, um, and then we'll analyze what are the pieces of those stories we can learn from that will help us uh, come into the present moment. Um, and then in the second half, um, Gina and I are going to invite you into a really exciting opportunity to be together with Honor the Earth and MNIPL and a bunch of partners on February 15th um, at an event called um, Rise and Repair, Indigenous Rights and Climate Justice. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about how we've set that, that day up and how it, we hope, will be sort of a prototype of how we can together take action to change the world we live in. Does that sound good? Everybody give me. <laughs> All right. Um, we're scheduled to go until 8.30. Uh, we probably will go uh, till, you know, a little bit before 8.30, but I'm, I really welcome your interactions, your questions, um, your thoughts. So I invite you to use the chat liberally. Um, Terry, if you could be sort of watching the chat and if you see something come up, let me know, because um, it'll be hard for me to watch the chat and to be uh, talking with you all at the same time. All right, so I'm going to share my screen briefly. There we go. Um, so I want to just begin with this question. What, what spurs social change? When you think about 
uh, major movements for change in the history of the United States or um, in Minneapolis or um, across the world, uh, what are the ingredients of that change? So just take a moment to, to write that in the chat, and I will actually look in the chat right now as you write. Just what are some of the ingredients of what makes a movement moment? What causes us to uh, see large-scale social change? So take a moment, think about it, write it in the chat, and then I'm going to start to respond. Okay, I'm seeing some things roll in. Grassroots support, totally. Um, and I'd love for us to think about what that word grassroots means. First of all, I love just the thought of grass growing, right? It's got some roots. Um, and, uh, you know, why is it the roots that we need? Um, empathy. Um, in order to create movements, we need to understand each other. Mass social unrest, that's a huge part of so many social movements. Uh, justice a vision of a better life, not just a vision of the horrible thing that's gonna un unfold if we don't take action, but a vision of what will happen if we do take action. Mutual support, a spiritual core, uh, a few strong-minded people being discontent with the status quo. Awesome, Sienna, we will come back to that for sure. Um, something happens to one person that breaks the tipping point. So tipping point is such a wonderful um, image, right? At some point, massive things have been um, building up and there's a moment in which it can no longer continue the way it is. Um, certainly, if we think about the uprising um, in uh, 2020, that was a tipping point for us in Minnesota and across the world. It was a racial reckoning. It was a time of um, great movement. Um, Carol says groups, teams, totally part of that. Um, and a lot of people agreeing and wanting the same change, right? You can't make large scale social change for, you know, four and a half million people in Minnesota or eight billion people in the world without having some agreements that that needs to happen. Unless, of course, you have total dictatorship. Um, persuasion, leadership. People realizing that it affects all of us, right? If I can't see that my future is uh, tied up in the future of the woman who's sitting next to me with her child on the bus, then we are um, maybe not gonna be ready for that change. Um, and then Maxine says, above all, um, uh, all of the above things, but also culminating in some sort of policy change, something that, that makes that change the law of the land. Um, vision, passion, et cetera. Um, thank you all so much for that. That is like basically my whole talk right there in those words. Maybe what I'll try to do now is to put order to those words so that we can see um, how it works. And thank you, Shoto. I really pride myself on having an organization with a strategy. Um, okay, um, so the next question I wanted you to think about is think of a time when you were part of a social movement in the making. What did it feel like? What were some of the emotions that came came out when maybe you um, felt like we were winning, like the change was upon us, like the change was happening? And I'm thinking about, um, I have this great photograph, which I won't share with you right now, but the, the moment in time where um, uh, the marriage amendment was defeated in the house and then gay marriage became law of the land in just this incredible celebration. Um, and how what a euphoria it was to see that the world, in fact, doesn't stay stuck forever. Um, what are some other um, things that you felt when that kind of change was um, in our midst? So thanks. Um, uh, Molly says uh, connected, right? And it's like, you're not just an individual person. It wasn't that I was gonna be able to get married when that happened. It was like, I felt a connection to this huge human family. Relief, totally. Sometimes uh, just waking up after election day and feeling this great sense of, oh my God, I'm not gonna have a, a rock on my chest for the next four years. Um, hopeful that things will actually change. Um, 
And uh, right, so there's sometimes some skepticism, especially when it's some large scale policy change. And I definitely think uh, Gina and I are gonna talk about that um, tonight. Um, and I think that that feeling of pride and joy is is not to be under underrated. Um, like when we when something really terrible is in our midst and we feel like we can't do anything about it, we our psychologist will tell you it leads to depression and anxiety and crippling um, inability to live life. But if you're able to get together with a group of people and take action. Um, and see that that action makes a difference. I mean, the incredible joy, but also the pride in knowing that you are part of something bigger than yourself, um, even if it's only a small win. Um, okay, a couple of things about these pictures. Um, first of all, I just wanna say when I grew up, um, I feel very lucky to have grown up in a household in which I didn't feel like because of my gender that I was um, you know, not gonna have the kind of um, uh, powerful future that my parents envisioned for me. So, but when I learned that my grandmother had grown up in a time where women couldn't vote, I was just incredulous. Um, so anyway, I just want to uh, be give a shout out to my parents for never letting me think that it was a there could be a world without women voting. Um, but of course, there were. Um, and I think about uh, my daughter's name is Clara, and there's an incredible woman named Clara Euland, and she was uh, one of the first, one of the women who formed the um, uh, the the uh, block for social change around the vote in uh, Minnesota in the 1920s. Um, and incidentally, she was killed by a bus uh, on University Avenue right outside the Capitol. So I just wanted to um, give her some shout out. Um, and of course, the next one is in the lower, um, the next one in history is the lower quadrant there. Um, uh, and, and of course, that's Martin Luther King Jr. on the Capitol. Um, that is the March on Washington. Um, and first of all, I want you to imagine how on earth did all those people get there to the mall? What did it take to get all those people there? Um, how many uh, how many fellowship halls and community centers and uh, you know living rooms uh, were preparing for that march in the days before they got there? What did that feel like? Um, to begin with. And then uh, Martin Luther King Jr. stood up and he had a speech that of course made history. And the speech said, I have a dream. It didn't say I have a nightmare. Um, he could have said I have a nightmare, but instead he said, I have a dream. Um, and he was um, talking about the world that he wanted to see. Um, Incidentally, I want to say by the time Martin Luther King got to Washington for the March on Washington, uh, there was a huge focus at the beginning of the civil rights movement on, um, you know, removing segregation and all the sort of uh, legal barriers to equality. Um, by the time he was assassinated in the late 1960s, um, he was um, advocating for something very different. He was advocating for uh, fair wages for everybody and economic equality. And I wanna say that um, while we hear a lot about the like anti-segregation campaigns, uh, we don't always hear about the poor people's campaign that he was part of starting, which was really about making sure that um, everybody had the right to a home and electricity and a family wage that would make it possible for them to have the same opportunities. And I think we're in a little bit of that moment right now. Um, you know, part of the promise was delivered, but this huge other part of the promise was was not. And so if you go up to the other um, picture, um, maybe some of you know who that is with the bullhorn. Um, that's Nakima Levy Armstrong. And this was actually not in um, the uprising after George Floyd. Um, this was um, earlier at the, um, in North, North Minneapolis at the third precinct. And um, and I like to show this picture because I think that you know police abolition in the city of Minneapolis, you know, we think that it sort of emerged immediately because um, uh, we George Floyd was murdered and then all of a sudden everybody woke up. But it's not true because people were organizing for decades to get people to start paying attention to police violence in Minneapolis. Okay. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about social movement theory. Um, there's sort of three phases of 
academics who talk about social movements. The first was a group of people, I don't have a picture for this, but it was a group of people who were responding to horrible working conditions, um, for example, in the meatpacking plants in Chicago. Um, it was the early 20th century labor movements. Um, their, their philosophy was that it, until things got bad enough, people would just accept what they got. But it, when you reach a tipping point, people are going to flow into the streets, they have no choice, and then the change will happen. And there's a lot of truth in that. Um, but it, as time progressed, and as we came into the 60s and 70s, people started being more analytical, more scientific about social movements. And they said, we can, we can put some sociological theories on top of this. Um, and they had a theory called resource mobilization theory. Um, and this was an approach to social movements that tried to explain their emergence in terms of access to money or access to volunteers or organizational skills or leadership, all the sorts of things that you all mentioned up there in the chat at the beginning. What do we need in order for a social movement to succeed? These folks went and tried to sort of quantify it. Um, so their, their basic philosophy was that um, basically you could have individual grievances all day long. I can be really upset about line three. I can be depressed, I can lose sleep, I can be angry, um, but it doesn't help me very much. Um, uh, if I don't have a social movement organization. So this theory was looking at how it was that these social movements, uh, movement organizations were created. And again, I know I'm being totally academic, but that's what you signed up for tonight. Social movement organizations formed. People started meeting in around kitchen tables during the civil rights movement. If you can imagine um, Rosa Parks um, didn't, uh, wouldn't give up her seat on the bus. And um, she sparked a, a movement that shook the nation. Um, but actually it wasn't just her individual grievance. It was the fact that all across Montgomery, Alabama, people were willing to come um, together in order to organize the bus boycott. Um, they were able to, you know, this group was gonna put taxis together in this five block radius. And somebody else was in charge of the refreshments at the, um, at the fellowship hall and somebody else was leading songs. And so uh, because they had social movement organizations and they were able to attract leadership like Martin Luther King, they were able to create a strategy that helped them win real change, not only desegregation of the buses, but also, um, you know, obviously spurring the civil rights movement. So the third part of their, their theory is that it's actually not, um, it's not enough to have a really good organization. You also have to have an opportunity um, that comes through society. So many of us have been organizing in Minnesota over the last five years, going to the legislature, and it's been kind of a rough patch, right? Lots of uh, good ideas, don't even get a hearing. Um, you know, there's no opportunity to actually move legislation because we had a majority of climate deniers in the legislature. Now, 2023, we have a um, DFL trifecta. Um, I would not say it's necessarily a, an environmental justice trifecta, um, but we have a real opportunity to move people and make change. Um, so if you think about individual grievances, how it feels to be alone in your house, angry and, you know, just bitching about things, you know, uh, how it feels to get together in a group that really is moving things. And then what are the opportunities that, that need to exist in order for the, the social movement organization or your group to make a difference? Um, and I will say that social movement organizations can be as little as a you know, team of neighborhood folks getting together in order to, you know, lobby for a new playground structure, or it can be, you know, huge coalitions of organizations like the 100% campaign in Minnesota um, lobbying to have state law or international law changed. Um, and then I'll just, I will write this at the end because I'm going to show you these slides. Uh, the success of these movements depend on, um, they describe human capital being like the, um, and by the way, I, I'm going to swipe that from the, um, from the presentation. Um, there's the whole body of literature that talks about social capital and natural capital and human capital. Um, 
I try to not use those words because it's just, um, first of all, capital is part of the problems that we're trying to emerge out of. So why should I use those those words? It's difficult for me as an academic to move out of them because it's what's in the literature. Um, so anyway, we have to reject the academic literature just like we build a new story among ourselves. Um, so in any case, we do need to think about the, the kinds of relationships we have, the skills we have, um, the um, social and financial and sort of infrastructure opportunities that are going to help us to move forward. Um, thinking a little bit about the, <clears throat> the um, pipeline resistance movement up north, um, there were multiple camps where people gathered. Um, you know, in order for that to work, there had to be land for people to, to gather on. Um, so just an example. Okay, so I'll, um, Terry, would you do me a favor and queue up that video and then I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and you can start start sharing it? I sure will. Awesome. Um, so this is the, the Keystone Excel video. You should have that link. Um, so I wanna say there's one more sort of uh, wave of social movement theorists um, that came after the 70s and 80s where the resource mobilization theorists were, you know, um, duking it out about, you know, what makes the perfect social movement. Um, there was a group of people who were like, you know what? It's just not as technical or as analytical as you think. Actually, social movements uh, come because of the tipping points, because there's energy, uh, because there's an identity shift. It's actually because people see themselves as different than they did the day before. It's not just how many volunteers, did you have a hundred or five? It's more about, did those volunteers see themselves as embodying that new story? Um, so I think it's really both of those. And I think, especially as MNIPL thinks about um, our relationship with Honor the Earth and um, the the types of movements we're trying to form. It's about being in a new story um, that has really created the opportunity. Um, so I have queued up this video for you that is, um, it's a very old story, but it's a lovely video. And I'd like you to watch it. And as you watch it, think, and you can write in the chat as you're watching, um, what are some of the elements of the social movement that um, Bill McKibben is trying to describe that emerged as part of the Keystone story? Um, so, Terry, I'll stop sharing and let you share. But we can't hear, Terry. The pipeline's impact on our climate will be absolutely critical. For the first time ever, a big fossil fuel project has been rejected because of its impact on the climate. The pipeline's impact on our climate will be absolutely critical to determining whether this project is allowed to go forward. President Obama's rejection of the Keystone XL pipeline is proof that there is at least some power in the hands of the people. It's important to take a moment to celebrate because this victory did not come easy. It took years of hard work from a big, broad, new kind of movement. We didn't win everything. The southern half of Keystone got built. Big Oil's making another run at Congress to get the pipeline finished. The larger fight against the fossil fuel industry is far from over. So we've got to take stock of what we learned along the way. First and foremost, build a diverse coalition. Every type of person led this movement. Let's stand together and uphold this pipeline. It started with indigenous communities in Canada and ranchers in Nebraska. We do not have to sacrifice to meet Trans Canada's bottom line. Then came students, scientists, families, farmers, frontline communities. We all fought shoulder to shoulder. This is my land. The pipeline will not go without a fight. The second thing we learned is don't be afraid to put your body on the line. One of the tools that came into play was peaceful civil disobedience. You are going to be risking arrest. You're going to be lining up on this Thousands side. of us were arrested and went to jail, from the White House to Texas. Sit-ins, blockades, nonviolent direct action showed the moral urgency of rejecting this pipeline. We will stop whatever pipeline you try to build. The third insight, be creative. We knew we could never outspend the fossil fuel industry, but we figured we could tap into the currency of movements. We circled the White House hand in hand. We coordinated days of action in communities everywhere. When Obama was on the move, people were there every time to make their voices heard. 
In all social movement victories over time, people have taken to the streets. Thousands of people marched past the White House. They call for President Obama to reject the Keystone XL pipeline. With opposition to the pipeline as a big rallying cry, we galvanized the biggest climate demonstration the U.S. had ever seen. If this pipeline goes through, it will be at the cost of human life. And then as all these battles intensified, we showed up in droves for the largest climate march in the history of the planet. Lastly, never give up. People said this fight was impossible, that we'd never win, that Keystone was a done deal. They'll tell you the same, whether you're fighting fracking or mountaintop removal or campaigning for divestment or arguing for a serious climate policy in Congress. Don't listen. We are at our lunch kind of moment for the 21st century. Do the right thing. Today we act. Today we send a message to them and everybody else. We are taking back our futures! This is the fight of our time, maybe the fight of all time, so be a part of history. Join us. All right. What did you notice in that video? You can go off of mute, you can um put it in the chat what was the recipe that bill mckibben was um advocating for and what were the um what were the if you were to come at that from a resource mobilization theory perspective what what resources were was he bringing to was he was he uh shining a spotlight on um okay so i want to start and Record. So please keep them coming if you have thoughts. Um, and uh, um, I see you with your hand up from Mount Zion. Um, it's Janet. And um, I just wanted to add that he had a diverse group, um, both in age and diversity and race. And he had a lot of people. So it's size and quality. Awesome. So it's size. So he had, there's people, and again, of course, this isn't Bill McKibben's movement, right? It's our movement. It's everybody's movement. Um, but uh, because the movement was across the country, was was responding from to communities from all over, um, and because the climate movement was able to bring, the People's Climate March was able to bring, you know, almost half a million people into the streets of New York, um, the world could not look away. Um, it had to be for everybody. So people, everybody could see themselves in that movement. Thank you so much. Um, Matt says, you know, the diversity of the coalition, building coalitions, it's a huge part of um, creating social change. I mean, it's not always easy because building coalitions comes with compromise. Uh, what was one of the things that was so cool about the Keystone fight way back in the day was that um, this um, organization called the um, Cowboy Indian Alliance was created. And again, that was uh, sort of tongue in cheek. It almost feels like ancient history now when that was formed. Um, but the idea was that there was um, a group of people who really didn't have a lot of common interests and in fact had a lot of common Pro, you know, uh, you know, conflict. And um, so, um, and yet they were both at the table um, around Keystone Excel. That made the decision makers pay attention. Um, energy, um, the energy of those moments. And of course, that wasn't just, it didn't just happen because people showed up in New York, right? People brought music, they brought um, uh, speakers that were inspirational, they, um, really focused on creating art that was going to be motivational. Um, Judith says, uh, following Obama wherever he went. Um, this is part of, um, part of building a movement is having a plan for who your target is. And so if Obama is ultimately the decision maker, um, what the movement tried to do, and again, this is organizers from across the country, I was one of them, who would get on these coalition calls and say, let's all follow Obama around. Instead of one person following Obama and somebody else saying, well, I'm gonna lobby the court in my state, 
I mean, some of that did happen, um, but really having some coordination so that everybody was doing the same types of actions um, is what it made it made it possible to get the press that was needed and just to build that story in Obama's mind. Um, okay, so um, I am going to go back to the slides for a second. I love this concept. Um, really, it comes down to the people, the power we build together, and the change that we imagine is possible. And so this is a powerful, oops, this is a powerful diagram that um, comes out of um, a gentleman, a social movement organizer named Marshall Gans, who wrote um, a book um, a little booklet, and I'm, I will attach it in the chat, a copy of the PDF. It's open for public consumption. Um, but he, he talks about how the recipe for um, making a, a change is, um, is going up this stair step. And first, we have to have our own story, right? I feel upset about something. Um, I need to be able to share that story with others. I need to create the story, share the story. Um, and I need to create shared relationships so we have the possibility of building coalitions. Uh, we have to make sure that we have a structure with which to come together. Um, all of those people back in the day who were organizing against the Keystone Excel pipeline, um, it wasn't until they started having phone calls that were multi-state phone calls that people were able to, to coordinate some of their activities. So creating a shared structure means you have to have a time for the coalition call. Somebody has to have the Zoom link um, and uh, tell people that this is gonna be one hour, et cetera. Um, and you can see that you know, MNIPL, for example, we try to do this. We try to have a, a time every month that we have a community connector webinar. That's part of our shared structure. Um, it's not enough just to bring people together. You've gotta have a shared strategy. Um, so, you know, the Keystone fight, they said, decided that Obama's the decision maker. Our strategy is to convince Obama that he's not going to get elected unless he or reelected, unless he listens to the people. And um, that this is overwhelmingly popular to stop this pipeline. And so we're going to convince Obama to stop it at the federal level. It could have been a totally different strategy. Um, but it, once we had a strategy, we all had to get behind the same strategy um, and share the action that made it possible to reach the goal. Um, I'm gonna send these slides out so you can take a look at this in more depth later, but here's some good questions to ask when you're thinking about the strategy. Um, so who are my people? Um, and are they the diverse coalition that Bill McKibben described in that video or, or is it just one group? You know, If you're trying to change the, the structure of the playground equipment, in your neighborhood, maybe your people are the people in your neighborhood. Um, if we're trying to change uh, the state of Minnesota so it creates um, regulation that will stop future pipelines, we need um, the, you know, the people of Minnesota to show up and say that they um, are unhappy with what happens and need to see change. Uh, what is the change? What is the goal that they have? Is it specific um, or is it too general? It's really good to have specific goals because it makes it easier to come up with a shared strategy. Uh, where can they get the power to do what they need to? You know, Enbridge was able to get the power to, um, uh, through money, to be able to pay to send lots of buses from all over the state down to the PUC um, and put people up in hotels and stuff like that. Um, the pipeline resistance movement didn't have that money but we did have people. Um, which tactics can they use? Um, and what's their timeline? So these are just some questions to consider. I'm gonna go past these three. Um, and I am going to um, talk for a minute about today in Minnesota. And um, Gina, um, I'm gonna, um, you're gonna be up in just a moment to tell your story. I'm not looking to see if you're good to go with that. Hopefully you are. Um, 
Okay, so what happened today in Minnesota? This is a picture from a few days ago. Um, there's a bunch of people in the state capitol. That's Sarah Wolf and Juventino Meza from MNIPL staff. Folks from across the state were getting together to um, urge senators to pass the 100% carbon-free electricity um, bill. Um, I want to. Gina is going to tell a little bit of history of what happened in the weeks ahead of time, or a little bit about that. I can say a little bit about it, but this wasn't an entirely joyful moment um, because um, there was a lot of compromise in the bill that went to the um, went to the House and to the Senate. Um, and um, some of us in the environmental justice community had been working for weeks to try to get rid of some uh, really terrible things that uh, that were in the bill and are now signed into law. Um, so um, incinerators and um, uh, large-scale hydro in Manitoba, an, a um, peaker plant that is going to pollute um, in northern Minnesota, were all things that we were urging to be removed from the bill, and, and we had some success, but not total success. Um, and there's uh, Tim Walls today. He he signed it into law. You can see a lot of happy people. Um, that's uh, Nick Friends in the. Um, you can't see me moving my. Anyway, Nick Friends is standing right behind uh, the podium, and uh, Jamie Long. Those are the two authors in the Senate and the House, um, and um, you know some folks who have been working for years to try to um, push this renewable. Um, or carbon-free electricity mandate. I'm gonna say a couple words about what went in and what didn't. Um, you'll hear that it's 100% carbon-free by 2040. And, okay, hold on one second. Um, thanks, Terry. Um, you'll hear that it's 100% by 2040, but the question is the 100% of what, like what is the 100%? Um, it's actually 100% carbon-free electricity and that includes nuclear, uh, existing large-scale hydro um, and um, incineration. Um, and as you can imagine, you know, incineration itself creates a lot of carbon and it's also terrible for people's lungs. Uh, we were really excited um, because we worked really hard to have the, the Hennepin County HERC be excluded from being able to be counted as this um, carbon-free energy, and we won. So we got the worst of the plants to be taken off of the list, but there's other incinerators that are still counted. Um, Manitoba Hydro is a, a large-scale dam that is up in Canada um, that has devastated Cree communities. And while we were able to get them to say that uh, future dams could not be counted as um, this carbon or this renewable energy, the best kind of energy, it's not, um, uh, the, the current ones can be counted in that way, um, which was a huge, huge compromise. Um, and um, the last thing is that there's this uh, natural gas plant called the Namaji um, Trail uh, Energy tra Trail Center, tra Namaji Trail uh, Energy Center, the um, NTEC plant, and that was um, uh, excluded from the from the bill. Um, so I want to hand it over to Gina. And um, I'd love you to tell your story of, you know, how you got involved in this uh, movement and, um, and, you know, how you sort of find yourself in this moment that we're in today. Yeah, thank you so much, Julie, and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I'm Black Bear Clan, Anishinaabe from Turtle Mountain Band, and my name is Gina Peltier. I'm also with, uh, I'm a project developer and organizer with Honor the Earth. Um, I've been with Honor the Earth for a few years now. Um, and then I guess uh, having the last name of Peltier, I've been kind of in the movement since I was born, unfortunately, but I guess that just gives me a little more experience um, and, and, and all that good stuff. So um, 
you know, I want to start off by saying, you know, I don't really like speaking in front of people, but, you know, I hear a lot of people say speak, even if your voice trembles. And, and I've seen with my experience and time and time again, that, you know, it's a good thing that I open my big mouth and, and, and talk and, and share all the knowledge and information that I do have. Um, so, you know, um, like Julia said, there is the 100% um, bill that went through, and I'll go into that a little bit more here in um, a little bit. But, um, you know, I just want to share that um, we were, um, I was front lines, uh, line three on, on the resistance of line three. So um, I just want to share with you what I did last year um, regarding this whole. Um, rise and re rise and resist and rise and repair um, this whole gathering that we got going on going to talk to the legislators so after line three after the construction of line three happened was completed in october um you know everyone was just exhausted defeated and um i knew that you know we couldn't stop we had to keep going i myself had to keep going um, and so last year I spent a lot of my time, um, battling, I would say mansion, the mansion deal. So Senator Manchin wanted to, uh, essentially make it to where they could fast track oil permitting. And we all know that's not a good idea. So last year, there was quite a few times he wanted to introduce this legislation and get it passed through. And so, we kept um, organizing and, and, and um, talking to our legislators. So where it first started for me is that I started, um, a group of us started setting up meetings with our legislators and um, we would talk to our legislators about the mansion deal. And I could not wait to get up and share my story because with having firsthand experience with resisting line three on the front lines, I had a whole lot to talk about the destruction that putting toxic oil pipelines through land does. So I would talk about what we did with line three and how there were over a thousand arrests and my, I myself was arrested while praying. And that, you know, with line three, you have this toxic tar sands oil pipeline going through nearly half of North America's fresh water. And the whole reason I got involved with line three is because, well, I thought we were gonna be okay. We worked really, really hard to get Minnesota Governor Tim Walls elected because he said he wasn't going to approve of line three, but then he turned around and approved of it. So then we all had to get off our couches, which I love my couch. I love sitting on my couch, but um, through this movement, um, I found that there are a lot of smart, beautiful people out there that I love and that are worth fighting for. So, um, but we had to get off our couches and fight. And so um, when there were thousands of us who gathered together and came upon an Enbridge easement that was going over the Mississippi River, we were able to overtake that easement and stop construction for eight days. So during those eight days, there were thousands of us who were able to drink water out of the Mississippi River. And after those eight days, we peacefully, left um, around over 40 of us took citations but we had solid proof that we were able to drink the water out of the Mississippi River without getting sick. Shortly after that Enbridge fracked out their toxic chemicals into the Mississippi River. Our fish developed blisters and you're no longer able to even swim in the Mississippi any longer. And so as I'm sharing this with these legislators I really feel that I'm getting my point across with letting them know that, hey, we were able to drink the water before Enbridge put this toxic tar sands oil pipeline through nearly half of North America's fresh water, and now you can't drink out of it. So Enbridge successfully poisoned our water. And it's quite scary because, you know, 
water became a commodity on Wall Street of December of 2020, when Governor Walz approved of the permits for line three. And on top of that, I also shared with the legislators that I, it is completely mind blowing that we never needed fossil fuels to begin with. We all know Henry Ford's first automobiles ran off of hemp fuel and the whole body is made of hemp steel. So we never needed to rely off of fossil fuels. We always had a perfectly good resource to rely off of. On top of that, nowadays with all the industrial farming, we're, ha we're getting less nutrients in our soil. It's causing us to lose all these nutrients. So I can always go on and talk about hemp because when, you present all these problems to the legislators and to all these other people, they like to hear the solutions and the other possibilities and the good things that we could and should be doing. So I always do like to bring up hemp because I do believe it could save us with this whole climate catastrophe. Hemp not only puts nutrients back in the soil, it cleans the air, it takes the carbon dioxide out of the air. Um, you can make your houses out of hemp, you can make, clothes out of hemp, you can heat your houses out of hemp. So I go and I share all this good information with these legislators. We have the capabilities and the technology to use better sources of fuel. We never needed fossil fuels. We never need to be mining for resources that, you know, hemp could just do a great job and better job at it. So, um, you guys, I can go on and on and on. <laughs> but um, when talking to these legislators, I do feel like um, with sharing my story and then sharing bits and pieces of information like this, I really feel like we're getting through to them. And, um, you know, and another thing I do like to share is that most of the time we know more than these legislators. So it's really, really good that we get in and we visit with them and they hear our voice. So even though we are mighty with just beings and individuals, when we come together, like the thousands of us who took that Enbridge easement, we can really do greatness. Um, so we do have this event coming up because a lot of people don't know that you can go talk to the legislators. And I myself was very naive to the whole process until I started getting involved. And now, you know, people are saying I'm a pro at it, which I really don't think I am. <laughs> you know, even here talking to you guys today, I feel really nervous and I'm stumbling over my words and I feel like I'm not getting the information through to you. But all my experiences people come back to me and they're like thank you so much for sharing I didn't know this or I didn't know that and and all that good stuff so you never know even just talking to your neighbor about what's going on could start unfolding all this goodness that people want to start getting involved. I even talked to the people who changed my oil about what's going on. And now, you know, we have a really good relationship, you know, they, and I always share that with them too. You know, last year you had fossil fuel companies who made trillions of dollars, not millions, not billions, trillions of dollars in one year. Well, you have over half of full-time working Americans not even being able to afford a one bedroom apartment. So it's quite crazy that 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 is even being allowed to go on. But moving forward, we wanna make sure that the legislation that do, is starting to be passed focuses more on everyone. So everyone has a fair share of what's going around instead of having it just go to the 1% so they can store it in offshore bank accounts where, you know, people are suffering. They can't even go to the dentist or get their health care when in all actuality, Mother Nature, Mama Aki, Mother Earth, she provides everything we need to survive and thrive. We shouldn't have to be working so hard just to barely be getting by, let alone making compromises that don't need to be there. There's no reason we should be making these compromises that do so much harm just to get one good thing across when we don't need the stuff that causes all the harm. So, Gina, can you just say one word about, um, and in a second, I'll, I'll share our, our, our joint platform, which is really exciting. Uh, but just tell me in 30 years from now, you're going to be an elder in your community and you're going to be telling your, maybe your, you know, little, um, you know, Nebies, what, what's going on. Um, can you just, what is the world going to look like? What is your dream? 
Well, and it, not to be a downer, but you know, recently it just came out that Exxon Mobil knew the damage they were going to cause, and that the scientists are right on cue of what's going to happen. So if they're, if they, if everything they predicted is happening, they predicted we have less than ten years to make a drastic change, which I know we can make that drastic change. We saw with the pandemic that we are capable of making great change. Um, but we really, so I just, I'm really hopeful. <laughs> and in the future, I see that, um, that I'm able to tell these youngins that we were able to come together and actually do what was needed to be done to, make a better future so um a drastic change not this slow stuff and making these compromises where it's going to take us 20 30 40 years we don't have that much time so really i am full of hope that we are able to come together in the masses to make the great change that we're capable of making you know um so yeah <laughs> my gosh i i using Exxon's own story to get us motivated to take action. That's just beautiful. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and see things like that keep me going and opening my big mouth. And that should encourage everyone else. Like, share your story. People need to hear it. They need to hear how concerned you are. You know, I could just go back to being a housewife and and not, and you know, just sitting in my house and doing my crafts. But in all actuality, you know, I love everyone. Like everyone is so beautiful. I didn't know that before getting into the, to this space and the movement. And, and so now I can't, I can't sit back and, and have you guys do the fight. It takes all of us. I remember the first time you and I really had a, a good conversation was a few years ago, Gina, and we were on the steps of the Minnesota Supreme Court, except for we went there to protest and they were closed because of COVID. <laughs> <laughs> we had so much fun getting to know each other. And so anyway, that was beautiful. All right, you guys, I'm going to move us um, um, to the sort of the final part of this evening, which is to talk a little bit about what's happening in our movement uh, on February 15th and beyond um, in the work that we are trying to do to create this Indigenous rights and climate justice platform. Um, and this is the work that Gina and I are doing together every day and little meetings, big meetings. And um, so here we are, I'm gonna share again. That is, yes, that's the screen I wanna share, great. Um, so this is a new year, it's a new political landscape. As I said, we have the opportunity structure as they say in the social movement theorists um, land. Um, for us to be able to make large scale change, super exciting. So um, we know that um, we only have 10 years, as Gina said, we also know we only have um, the this legislative session for us to figure out how $17 billion of Minnesota surplus is gonna be spent. Uh, we've got some incredible opportunities. We've got the federal government who has rolled out this Inflation Reduction Act. There are hundreds of millions of dollars that are set to come to Minnesota. Uh, and how those dollars come to Minnesota is going to be determined within the next uh, few months. Like things will be set in motion that will make it happen. Um, and you all have an opportunity to join us in being um, clear that as we build towards 100% carbon-free electricity, we get to decide, are we gonna do it in a way that is going to be accessible to all people, um, that's going to help us um, heal some of the past harms that have been done, um, that is going to be um, what Martin Luther King thought of as um, a, um, a world in which people not only were not segregated, but were in fact um, all able to live a, um, a life of um, safety and meaning. So we have a dream um, and that is to be living together um, in a world in which we have done the work of uh, reparation, in which we uh, are able to all be living sustainably on the landscape in a way that is not um, taking more um, than we should from 
the um, more than human world. Um, so here's our goals, big bodacious goals. Um, we want to um, get the legislature to start paying attention to reparation, real material reparation. Um, we have a couple of things that, that these organizations are following. Um, we're supporting a um, urban indigenous legacy um, uh, amendment that is not legacy amendment, urban indigenous um, legacy act, which will bring a bunch of money into Twin Cities area um, native organizations so that they can do their work. Um, it's not uh, reparation um, in the way that we need, but it is a step of material um, uh, material benefit, and it's what has been asked for. Um, we're following a bill that is being introduced by uh, Mary Kunish to have a deed tax, um, and um, she hasn't introduced that yet, and she has asked us to like stand by to be ready to support it, and we are. Um, so we're waiting to hear about that. Um, we are really passionate about telling the truth, like Gina was doing. Uh, we don't have 30 years to make this change in a slow way. We have to do it now. Um, 2040 is not soon enough. Um, we need to do not just um, not just electricity, but transportation and agriculture. Um, we need to totally shift the way people think about their relationship to each other. Um, that's called real truth telling. Um, and that involves really being honest about climate change. Um, there's some exciting bills in that bucket. Um, one is called the Next Generation Climate Act that Ellen Anderson has put together. It's about modeling what it's going to take in every sector to get us there. Um, and there's a lot of other things. Um, the third thing is about economic development and just transition. Who's going to get the money um, from all of the electricity that is going to be deployed in Minnesota um, using non-carbon sources? Is it going to be uh, the big banks? Um, and is it gonna be the utilities that are owned by monopoly shareholders who benefit from the energy transition or is it gonna be our communities? Um, trust me, we're gonna need our communities to be able to retain their resources. Um, so let's make sure that we have funds available so that everybody can, um, so that everybody can benefit from the energy transition, jobs, um, energy ownership, et cetera. So we would love to see uh, what we're calling an innovation climate, uh, innovation finance authority or a green finance authority. It's a green bank. Um, there's been some pushback about the word green bank because people think it's an actual bank, but it's a, it is a it is a it is a place within the state government that will um, administer loans to people who would would fall through the cracks otherwise, making renewable energy um, accessible to everybody and a lot of other things. Um, we're interested in making sure that all the stuff that happened that made it possible for line three to be permitted doesn't happen anymore. So we have a whole team of folks who are working on regulatory reform so that we can stop future pipelines like the Summit natural gas pipeline. Um, and we also care deeply about environmental justice. There's an environmental justice table here in uh, Minnesota, um, and a lot of groups that are working on things like making sure that if um, a community is already impacted by toxic pollution, that they shouldn't have other toxic projects located in the area. That's called cumulative impacts. Um, we are working to make sure incineration is not, um, you know, counted as the good energy. Um, want to replace all the lead pipes. That'll create jobs and also be um, helping communities to be safe. Um, there's a whole, uh, if you go to the website riseandrepair.com, and it's A-N-D written out, um, you will find a um, an agenda, like a platform agenda you can read more about. Um, and here are some of the partners that we have been working with. Um, super exciting. This has come together truly in the last two or three weeks. People have been stepping up to support this work that Honor the Earth and MNIPL started. Um, and we brought in faith communities and other Native organizations first, but we have um, all of these environmental justice focused organizations that are supporting this, um, this platform. So I'm going to go back to what I asked in the beginning. Uh, what is the strategy that we're using here? Who are my people? What change do they seek? 
Where can they get the power? Which tactics can they use? And um, what's their timeline? Um, so I'm wondering if folks want to um, just spend a moment thinking about, about this movement that we're trying to put together. Who are the people that we need to get in Minnesota? Um, so what change are we seeking? It's really important. I've just told you a whole platform of stuff, right? It's kind of a little bit vague, a little bit general. Um, I'm concerned about the fact that we need to do everything all at the same time in order to create a just world. So what's the focus? So I'm curious to hear what you would think about that. Um, how are we gonna get the power to do this? How do we make sure that now that the 100% bill has passed and been signed into law, um, that we're gonna be able to protect the vision that Gina and I and everyone else has, which is one of real equity and repair? How are we gonna make sure um, to bring our power to the table to make that happen? Which tactics are gonna be used? And what's the timeline? These are the questions that we talk through as we start to strategize and, and organize for change. Does anybody wanna come off of mute and share an answer to any of these questions, just your thoughts on this? This is like the um, teacher asking the class something where they're not sure what the question is. Um, so maybe I should just ask a more specific question. Um, how, well, this is a more specific, but you've heard about what it takes to, you know, have social change happen, what some theorists think. What do we need to do in Minnesota at this moment in time in order to, to get there? Um, and I see Shoto, you've got your hands up. Thank you. Yes, I don't have a clear answer. Um, there is one thing that is an accessory to everything that I, I will just mention. Um, I think that we are not the only sentient beings on the planet and that we should be asking the others for help. Now, uh, Mother Nature has sent us a pandemic to reduce our population and get people to, you know, slow down a little bit. And while, while people did slow down, we saw some amazing environmental changes. Um, now, that's not the answer you want to hear. And what I'm thinking is that the power of, of, of a credible vision. Um, I was in the Transition Town Network for a while in two different places because I moved. And there's a vision of living well without consuming huge amounts of energy. Um, living well and while staying closer to home and things like that. And I think we don't have a unified vision. I think the vision that in, relies on electric cars and lithium mining is, is not a credible vision. And so I really want us to work on our vision. Thank you so much. First of all, um, where, like maybe we need to expand again remember that list of things was put together by a resource mobilization theorist right and i wonder if instead we could expand that and said where not just where is the power coming from right which is you know maybe the power is coming from um opening our ears to things that we weren't listening to before um i all the time and i know gene i say this in meetings sometimes i you know i'm like well i didn't know what we were going to do but so and so show, showed up and they brought this idea and mm -hmm. because they showed up it's like the spirit arrived right that was that became the idea because of the gathering and um gina i don't know how you how do you listen to the greater than human world as you start to think about pulling pulling the team together um, so I used to be so nervous about everything. Should I be doing this? Like even going out to the camps, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, and I'm one of those who like, I'm very law abiding, never wanted to get arrested for any, like, it just like always showing up on time. Right. 
And so um, getting into this, um, and and I am really spiritual. So, you know, I'd always uh, be driving and I'd be questioning and then I'd see, you know, uh, um, a bald eagle flying overhead. And I'm like, oh, there's my ancestors. They're telling me it's all right. And so through this whole thing, I've been learning just to go with the flow because if you have only good intentions and you only want to do good, things are going to fall in place. But, um, you know, I really do like Shoto's message too of getting everyone on the same grounds of like not having to live in excess, you know, like I really like that getting everyone on the same level of, Hey, we don't need all that. Life is just beautiful. Just going in your backyard. And, you know, that's true for me. So it's just, um, but yeah, with, uh, knowing that I just want to do good. I've always seen those hints from my ancestors telling me, keep going, you're doing just great. And then things turn out fine. So it's just, okay, let's keep doing it. <laughs> totally. Well, I think that everybody should be asking themselves that question. Thank you so much, Gina. I, you know, the power of um, just looking around and seeing where the stories are coming together. Um, um, and then I just want to say, Shoto, you're, 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 observation that our movement doesn't necessarily have a unified vision, you're totally correct. Um, and I, you know, I have come to see that, you know, like one group's, you know, goal is to, to, you know, continue status quo as usual and have, you know, a gas vehicle replaced by an electric vehicle, right? I mean, if that's the whole vision, it's not truth telling. Um, but it's also like, sometimes we have to work together with those people in order to create the sort of one specific change. So I, I think that, um, you know, part of the work, this is comes into that third wave of social movement theory, where it's about identity shifts and, and tipping points and, and rewriting the narrative. Um, I think we're at a very dangerous moment right now and that that there's people who who don't see that the only option is transformation. And um, and so, you know, it may be that having a uni more unified vision is part of what we need to do. It is something I want to say. I I find it to be very tricky because, well, I want people to all be on the same page so we can all pull the same rope across the finish line. That in and of itself is sort of a transactional analysis. And so sometimes I have to like take different people's where either where they're at in their own um, heart or in their own you know movement space, like actually a diversity of, of visions is part of the di incredible diversity we have on this planet. Right, it's just that we don't want only one perspective to have all the power, um, and right now they have a lot of it—not all of it, but a lot of it. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen back again, and um, this is a conversation I hope everybody will continue in your whole life. Okay, so I showed you all the the partners, that's cool. Um, here's what's happening on the 15th of February. So a week from tomorrow, um, we hope all of you will sign up to be there. Um, we have this incredible uh, rally coming together. And again, when I think about who are in this case, we have a goal um, at MNIPL and Honor the Earth and members of this bigger uh, platform coalition. Um, we are wanting the state government to take very specific actions that um, will uh, move the dial on um, you know, carbon truth telling and move the dial on uh, making sure that everybody has access to the renewable energy revolution. And that um, to me looks like um, passing into law this green bank concept that will drastically increase the ability for others to have, for everyone to have access to the resources. Um, it looks like um, having um, some uh, really strong uh, language around, um, you know, how we're going to uh, fix the regulatory process that went wrong in the past. Other things as well. Um, so we're bringing people together. We're going to um, gather at uh, Christ on Capitol Hill. If you've been to a lobby day today, almost everybody uses that space. Um, but we'll be in the sanctuary 
in the church that's right across the street from the Senate building and right catty corner to the Capitol. Um, and between 11 and 1, we're going to gather to um, tell stories. We're going to um, be um, learning from different organizations about the exact ways that they're envisioning these buckets to unfold during the legislative session. Um, we're then going to create some energy and some movement, uh, some movement noise. We're going to have probably a brass band that's going to help us march from the, the church over to the Capitol steps. We're going to march up the Capitol steps. We're going to have um, some incredible drummers that are going to um, be at the Capitol drumming us into the Capitol. We're going to have a round dance in the rotunda um, to bring people in. And then um, at some point, we're going to stop and we're going to hear about a half an hour of folks who are going to give some inspirational speeches about the context that they're growing this shared vision from. Um, Shoto, I'm I'm convinced more than ever now that I'm speaking out loud that really the goal here is to build a shared vision of an equitable clean energy future, not just a clean energy future. Um, so, you know, we're going to do that in the rotunda as we see each other and experience the energy that, that is um, part of being together. Um, after that, and actually all day, there's going to be an opportunity. Um, uh, Juventino Meza is our most recent um, organizer at MNIPL. He has um, set up 27 different legislative meetings for people in our network to attend. Um, so we're really needing massive recruitment. If you could imagine, if we could get 10 people at each of those meetings, we'd have 270 people. Um, but if it's only five, that's okay too. Um, but we're going to get people to meet with their um, senators and representatives and to tell their story. Why do they care about um, you know, rising up, having a common story about equity and the need for truth telling in climate, and um, and what's their vision of climate a climate just world? They don't need to hear all the details about what the green bank bill is going to require. They just need to hear um, about why it is that we are passionately showing up to uh, make sure that folks don't know, don't think that just passing 100% has gone far enough. Um, okay, so a couple of things. This is, um, I'm going to send these slides out so you see them again. As you start to think about what the, um, the day might look like, um, we are going to, you're going to want to be thinking about um, not only what is our sort of, uh, you know, how are we going to get to this renewable, um, equitable um, world that we envision, uh, but why? Who are the folks that we love? Who do we listen to? Why do we do this work? What's in our heart? So it's the head and it's the heart together that made it possible for us to take action. Uh, we'll talk about these um, ideas at the Capitol between or at the church between 11 and 1. Um, you'll be able to be broken up into groups to be able to be exploring some of these themes together. Um, Oh, what am I doing here? Okay, um, I think I described this already. Um, this is a picture, I love this. This was from the, the youth climate strike in 2019. And um, so that's a lot of young people in the rotunda. Can you imagine what the energy could look like if we bring you know, hundreds of people there on Tuesday? Um, and this is this beautiful uh, picture of um, this is some volunteers from MNIPL and Sierra Club in Duluth who came down to meet with Representative Kolzowski, um last Wednesday at the 100% campaign. And it's just really fun. It's fun to be with your uh, decision makers. They care so much about hearing um, your voice. Um, and so we're asking you, hopefully, to spread the word. Um, there are a bunch of um, uh, tools that are available in a social media um, kit. Um, Terry, would you be able to put those links that are in the on slide 32 into the chat? Um, we would love to have you spread the word, phone folks you know, <clears throat> put it in your newsletters if you have a chance. I know it's only a week. Um, do social media invites. And I'll just say a word about structure, right? If I um, and there, I am one of these folks in the middle. 
Um, and maybe I've been asked by Julia or Gina to go spread the word. I know a bunch of people and I'm gonna go be able to ask them. This is called a snowflake model and it's the way that we're organizing. Um, once you uh, get into this meeting with your legislator, um, I, I love to remind myself of these four C's. Um, first, you're gonna wanna make a personal connection with that legislator. Maybe it's about the neighborhood that you live in that they also live in. Maybe it's about kids. Maybe it's about the fact that you all love Lake Superior. Um, um, why is this? Um, and then you're gonna wanna give them some context. Why are you here? Why is it urgent? Um, are you hopeful? Um, how will their their participation in decision making make a difference? Um, so we'll do some training on this, but what's important for you to know is that um, you know you'll be able they'll be able to click to the the sort of the platform, the indigenous rights and climate justice platform so they can read what the group has said. Um, but you can let them know that you know what you really care about is the green bank because you know that there's a business in your neighborhood that, hasn't been able to get a loan to replace their um, insulation and refrigeration, and now they will be able to. Um, so how is their, their action at the legislature gonna make a difference? Um, it's really important in that legislative meeting to ask for a commitment. Say, can I, can I count on you voting for the Green Bank? Can I count on you voting to uh, change the regulatory structures so that Enbridge can't happen again? It doesn't necessarily have to be a house file that you describe. It could be like, can I count on you always thinking about equity before you make a decision about how the state's resources are spent? You get to decide what that looks like. Um, and then this last one of the four C's I think is really important. Once you've gone to the Capitol, um, once you've spread the word, how can you actually make the impact of what you've done even more powerful? So how you, can you catapult the small thing that you did by small slash big thing that you did by coming to the Capitol on the 15th and um, really magnify the impact of that? Um, so maybe you go home and you write a letter to the editor about your positions and your experience. Uh, maybe you use that as an opportunity to gather some people in your neighborhood or in your congregation to get together to also take action. So don't let it end with you. Make sure that you also then go and do what we talked about in that last slide, which is to catapult your um, uh, your experience and, and grow the power of it. Um, so I'll leave you with... Um, uh, when we send a follow-up email, you'll get some resources. There's a lot of great books out there. I'll, I'll send you the stuff from my, my Marshall Gans on the organizing people power change that I got a lot of the material from. Um, this is also a book that was written and available through 350.org called the Climate Resistance Handbook. Um, so if you, like me, feel like you want to learn more about the science of organizing, um, there's lots of places that you can go. So it's 820 and um, I would love if you have questions for Gina and I about the 15th, um, if you can, uh, we'll open up the floor. Um, maybe first questions about the 15th, what we're gonna do, how we're gonna do it. And then if you have uh, bigger, broader questions about organizing, I would love to uh, also engage with those. All right, if, if I don't see um, questions, let me uh, instead ask this of you. Um, can you use that little fun thing, the reaction button, and um, uh, tell me, do you know, are you, first of all, let's get some some thumbs up if you are planning to, to be there on the 15th or if you, um, uh, you know, are looking into it. Just give me a thumbs up if you're able to be there on the 15th. I know this is dangerous because everybody doesn't know how to use the reaction um, time. It, our events are not always on Wednesdays, but there are a lot of events on Wednesdays. Um, how about people who can um, uh, take the time to let somebody in your network know that this thing is happening on the 15th? Give me a thumbs up if you can let somebody know in your co community that you'll be able to 
Um, okay, um, you can take your thumbs down. Let me just say that one of the things that you can do if you're in a circle, so say you're in your congregation, you know that there's gonna be a big tabling fair in order to raise awareness about something in your congregation. Uh, maybe you're trying to get people to gather and come to the Capitol or something like that. But you're asking, you're um, you're wanting to get lots of folks to help you with recruitment. Um, one of the things you can do is you can say, you know, can I count on you to bring five people, right? And then when you call them back, you can say, you know, do you have five people? They'll be like, oh my God, I only have four. So much more effective than saying to people like, um, oh, come if you can because then they float away, right? But if you can get people to commit to you, it's actually a really important way to um, sort of get them in their own mind feeling like this is something that they're part of, that's part of, it's like part of their um, uh, accountability system to also be present for this movement. So anyway, I kind of botched it on this webinar tonight doing that, but I, I think it's it's a it's a helpful thing to, to ask people to, you know, be counted. Um, okay, other questions. Um, and if you don't have another question, if you would do me the favor of typing in the chat, um, just something that uh, inspired you or that you learned or that you have questions about um, that you're taking away um, with you tonight. Thank you, Judith. Um, I do think, Sienna, the importance of having a personal story, um, just to remind people, personal story, that's one of the first C's, um, but it's it's the the next, um, part is really um, sort of connecting that story to this bigger movement and then being really specific about what people um, need to do in order to make good on your request or on your, um, you know, for the movement and for, and for you. Thanks, Maxim. I know that you are somebody who knows a lot about this stuff. So hopefully those four C's can be useful to you in the future. It is sad, but true that there had to be concessions. And it's funny because when I listened to that, um, uh, again, the Keystone Excel video is inspirational to me. Um, you know, I was listening to Bill McKibben say that same word, right? You know, we didn't get everything that we wanted and that's absolutely true. Yep, and I want to say, Carol, you know what? I am also cynical on many days, and I think our, one of the biggest, again, equity is a huge thing we need to be very, very aware of. The other thing is false solutions, all kinds of opportunities for false solutions coming out of that bill. Um, so we need to be on guard, and one of the reasons that that's so scary is that how do I know the science of false or not false solution? Um, so, you know, who are the trusted people who can tell us that something is not really... Um, is not really right with things. Um, you all should pay particular attention to the Summit pipeline, which is an, a liquid natural gas pipeline. Um, they're uh, going to be um, hoping to build that thing and then um, be able to take natural gas from all these little bio or um, uh, ethanol plants across Minnesota, um, take it pipe it out to um, North Dakota and there's something called enhanced oil recovery. So keep keep your eye on that. That means uh, shooting what was given credit for being 
uh, carbon sequestration. Um, they're using it to pump it down under the ground to get other um, oil out of the ground, legacy oil fields that maybe weren't productive before. If they shoot this liquid natural gas down, they can, um, they can bring the other oil out. So it's just like literally a false solution. Um, but the way that the spreadsheets work, they can put it in one spreadsheet and then on another spreadsheet. So it looks like they're um, sequestering carbon. All right. Well, folks, it was great to be with you tonight. I am happy to stay on the call um, if people have more questions. Oh, Maxine, please go ahead. Um, yes, thank you. And thank you, um, Julia and Gina, for sharing all your stories um, and um, this wonderful presentation. Um, I, I, my question is just generally around advocacy and, and community building. And um, my question is, I'm, I'm thinking about just the um, limited amount of resources that community groups often have when um, advocating for themselves and against these larger systems of power. And um, while coalition building uh, is necessary, I'm just wondering how, um, from your perspective, you find that community, community groups are able to share the resources that they have and uplifting their neighbors while also finding themselves limited with um, their own uh, their own resources to advocate for themselves. Uh, I know it's kind of more of a general question, but uh, any thoughts you have, I'd be interested in hearing. It's a wonderful question. Gina, do you have anything that you would like to answer? I can also give an answer, but. I'll... So was it just kind of like, how do communities that don't have that many resources still show up. Um, I think that's just, it, it answer itself, you still show up. <laughs> um, I realized, I saw with the line three resistance that a lot of people didn't have anything and they still um, found ways to show up and support in any way they could. I showed up to do dishes and um, found out doing things um, that my talents were needed elsewhere than doing dishes. So um, you I still just, just <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's so perfect. Like the question answers itself, you show up, right? It, it's like, there's such an incredible metaphorical and real truth in that. Um, and so, so that's one thing, but the question is what makes people want to show up, right? And that's about identity, right? It's about sharing space in a way that isn't about the transactional win, but about the deep um, caring for each other. And um, I think that there's a lot of organizations that don't do that all that well, quite honestly. Um, I think that one of the toxic things that happens in our current movement is that uh, organizations compete with each other for resources. Um, and it's like, madness actually because we're all in this world together and so if we don't see ourselves as a movement instead of individual organizations like like the the enemy of the movement is the organization that has to exist only for itself right um so i think that that um creating collaborative like co collaborative collaborative spaces where multiple voices can get together and um, and really be heard. It's messy and it takes a lot of time, but it's it's so worth the investment um, because, um, yeah, it's only by being together that you get to know and love each other and see yourselves as one movement, right? You can't substitute that. And that's why being on the front lines was such an essential part of my life and the life of MNIPL is because it was actually when we just showed up because we showed up, that we got to know and understand that the question is actually a different question, if it makes sense, right? Because, and this is why in a way, and now I'm wishing I hadn't only talked about resource mobilization theory, because if you just run that theory down the to the end, then every group is gonna wanna compete with each other for resources, right? Whereas if you instead really focus on that transformational piece, then you can have something totally different. Thank you both. Yeah. 
All right, folks, I think we will turn off the recording, um, but I am here if people want to stick around for another couple minutes.